Today, we're chatting with Trey Llewellyn about all things sales funnels and how he used them to generate over $50 million in sales. You do not want to miss this one. So don't you change that dial or drop that phone. We're about to level it up and shatter the mold. Question. In a world where groupthink is the norm, others want what you've earned, and thinking for yourself will get a target painted on your back, how do you flip the script and level up your business, your money, relationships, your health, your status, and your life? That is the question, and this podcast will give you the answers. My name is Andrew S. Kaplan, and it's time to shatter the mold. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Shatter the Mold, Andrew S. Kaplan. Really excited to be here with you today. You know, the interview that we're about to do, I, I've got to say, there are certain interviews that stand out through Shatter the Mold that, you know, to me, they stand out as personal favorites and other ones that stand out as being, in my opinion, some of the most useful to my audience. This interview checks both boxes, and I'm really excited for this today. But before we get there, as always, quick update on the last Law of Attraction book you'll ever need to read. Uh, thanks to everyone who continues to leave those five-star rate reviews, who continues to read the book, spread the word about the book, email me about the results that they're getting through the book, and and just all the enthusiasm and goodwill around it. I really appreciate you. It's all the readers and all the enthusiasm and all the word of mouth that led it to being featured in USA Today and in Forbes and in Yahoo. And I could not thank you enough for that. If you've not checked out the book yet, you can feel free to go to lastlawofattractionbook.com. That'll auto forward you to the Amazon listing where you can check it out in Kindle or paperback or audiobook, or you are free to check out the YouTube channel devoted to it. That's youtube.com slash Andrew Cap. But with that said, let's dive straight into today's interview. I'm going to switch mics and we're going to hear from Trey. I am super pumped for today's guest. Uh, Trey Llewellyn is, uh, well, he's the e-commerce product sales king. We'll put it that way because that's what it says on his clubhouse profile. And I believe him because He's done over $50 million in sales, all from funnels, and he's got a reputation for high CPAs to his affiliates. And the really cool thing, what I love about this is I'm reading that off the clubhouse, and then he immediately switches gears and makes it about the reader, which tells you a lot about this gentleman here. But I'm sure we're also going to learn a lot more about him. So Trey Llewellyn, thank you so much for being here, my friend, and welcome to Shatter the Mold. Yeah, man. The, the big thing is, is like, you know, clubhouse is, is big right now. You know, like it's, it's amazing the 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 reach you can get on clubhouse and the people that you're meeting. Like I've met so many new people on clubhouse. I think it is cyclical. I think there is ups and downs through clubhouse right now, but I'm, st I'm still meeting people. I'm still greeting people. I'm still making connections that have probably been more powerful than the last like five years, I would say just yeah. from clubhouse. Yeah. It's, it's I'm again, the same experience. And you know, it's funny because <clears throat> again, before I hit the, uh, the record button here, I was telling you, I've been aware of you probably, you know, two or three years. So when you popped into the room, that I was hosting as a favor to the regular host, Mike Alden. Yeah. And it's like, oh, whoa, look at this. This thing is, you know, another cool person. And like, as soon as I saw you were in like um, question answering mode, I was like, I'm just going to be that rude guy just like keeps asking until I'm a nuisance because I love the opportunity to pick your brain. And here we are getting that as well. And um, thank you for being here. And I guess, you know, one thing I'd, I'd like to begin with is why, what brought you into funnels to begin with? Because obviously you were very effective with this. What kind of inspired you and brought you to that point in your life? That's a good question. So, um, you know, we were selling on Teespring and Teespring was an all-inclusive uh, website. So they had their own like store and then you had your own store, kind of like a Shopify really, where you're selling your own t-shirts and you did campaigns. And then from there, they took the merchant account, they took the transaction, they took all the data and they shipped out the shirt. This was times where Teespring wasn't even sharing the data. Like we didn't even be, we're, we weren't even able to collect the email uh, address. And so this is, this is the kind of dating us, but this is going back to lead pages. We had lead pages in front of uh, Teespring to hopefully collect the email address because mm -hmm. Teespring wasn't allowing us to have that. And uh, we actually were in such a, a, a pain, it was such a pain today because, the, because they didn't not, not only just give us the email address, but they, 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 that was all it was. So we had no control over anything except for, you know, driving traffic to the website. So I left, I, I said, Hey, we need to, we need to design our own website. And so we actually hired, hired an HTML designer to build a funnel that looked exactly like Teespring, not a website, but just a funnel per se, like, Hey, you know, sales page, order form, thank you page. Like that was it. And we paid $5,000 for it. We went to launch. It took two months to build. We went to launch the t-shirt and it totally bombed. 
Mm. There were so many bugs with it. It didn't do transactions. It was just so wonky. Like we felt stuck. And luckily a good friend of mine, Kim Doyle, she calls and she goes, I think there's a guy that's building something that you might want to be really interested in. And so he's calling it ClickFunnels. It's a guy by the name of Russell Brunson. I was like, I have no idea who this dude is, but I'm in. And I, from what Russell tells me, we are like the third or fifth person to sign up for ClickFunnels. So like we're user ID number three. Wow. Uh, that's how long we've been with them. And, uh, and we've done a ton of sales with those guys. And so that's kind of how we got into funnels uh, was by introduction. Wow. I mean, what a guy to, to kind of link up with too, because, you know, Russell does his thing. I did not know that batch. I didn't know you were, you were one of those very, very first people. So you've seen all the changes, all the adjustments, all the, the growth that they've had to go through and you've kind of like grown with them. So <laughs> I guess you're way beyond the two comma club. I think there's, there's an extra level past that one, right? There is. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which I think I might recognize in the background behind you, if I'm not mistaken, but I could be wrong about yeah, that. Yeah. It looks like we put a couple of records up there for you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Cool. So it seems to me like just through whatever experiences you have, you kind of knew right away, like you don't need a website, like a funnel is enough. It's about just getting someone to a sales page where you're demonstrating the value of whatever it is that you're selling and letting that doing the heavy lifting rather than having, you know, here's the big Trey Llewellyn profile and here's all my accolades and here's the about me thing. I actually looked around to find that and the best info I could have on you for this was your clubhouse profile. You're not even doing that on Insta. So it's very interesting to see that for someone who is so prolific and proficient. You don't got any of that that can, that's at least it's not very easily accessible if it's somewhere else. Yeah, I've not, I've not been a big like bragger guy, you know? Like I'll, I'll put some stats up there, but I'm not, you know, showing the house that we live in. I, you know, we rarely even show the Maserati. I've recently sold that. I don't even own the Maserati anymore. I got, you know, a freaking Lincoln for the kids. Mm. And so it's not like flashy. I'm not out buying Lambos or Rolls Royces. Like, dude, I'm, you know, like the more I'm on Clubhouse and the more that the people that come up and the more that I'm watching Facebook and I watch Instagram, but, and, and, I, and, and not even that, but the people that are on stages at events, I was just at a couple of events and I couldn't believe the people that they had on the stage. And what, from what these guys are talking, they're saying these big things, they're saying these numbers, or they're saying the strategy that they're using. And then I go, look, and they're not using that strategy. The strategy is mm -hmm. not, even, not even present. And so I think, you know, there's a lot of people that get caught up in that, like, oh, this must be working. I'm going to go follow that, uh, you know, that idea, that concept, that strategy, and then don't even do the due diligence to see that they're not doing it, right? With us, man, I, I, we make more money selling the physical products than I do coaching our students, mm. right? Like, I think that's a big, a big takeaway is, you know, that's one thing I've always been, you know, honest about and, and fruitful about is like, you should not coach with me if I'm not doing the numbers that, uh, you know, we say that we're doing, we're not, we're, you know, not, not showing up to do uh, or in it as close as we are. Like, I love the passion of going out and, you know, selling physical products. Like I get to play in a sandbox all day. Whereas, you know, I also said when I was young, this was no podcast, no Facebook groups, no nothing. Barely, I barely even had a bookshelf to go and grab. So I was alone, had no mentors to reach out to. And I always said, I mean, if I ever become successful in any way, then I'll be the wing to those to help them, you know, grow in their, their own ways and help people kind of survive and, and be the mentor that I can be and hopefully, you know, get them to the next level in their life. And that's kind of where the coaching comes from that we do. But, you know, the, the, the big passion is one, helping those guys and two, just going out and crushing uh, physical products and, and living the life of the highs and the lows of, uh, you know, selling, selling hundreds of thousands of, of physical products. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I'm not out here to, to hurt the pride of any coaches out there, but I've got to say, I love the fact that you make more money in the actual application of what you're teaching versus the teaching. Because we yeah. both know that when you're in that teaching space, you uh, you could charge a high fee and and rightfully so. So the fact that you can still do way better in the application of that is really impressive. And what really um, I enjoyed hearing, like when in our clubhouse conversation the other night, was you were describing when you're doing market research, you personally you don't have someone else in for you. You're going on the call. You're 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 calling people up. You're doing the research. So when they're like they're thinking it's a sales, just another salesperson. It's like no no I'm. I'm the CEO, I'm the owner, I'm the founder, and I'm here to find out. I love um, the fact that you get, you know, you roll up your sleeves and you get your hands dirty, so to speak, because I'm sure we both agree that gives you a unique insight 
into the market, into the customer, into what you're selling, into the whole process that money just can't buy. Yeah. Yeah. The, you know, the thing is, is like, ask yourself, when's the last time you got a phone call from a CEO mm. of a company, right? Like probably never. I don't know if I've ever been called from a CEO, to be honest. And where that comes from is, is, is that piece right there. You, you mentioned on the clubhouse, you're like the psychological aspect of it, you know, the psychology behind what we do. There is that, you know, I don't, like, I don't dwell on that stuff. That's, I'm glad you bring that up. I'm like, oh, he's right. Like, that's exactly what we're doing. But I never really called it that. I just like, you know, I'm just calling people as a CEO. But it, it does. It does have a lot of bearing weight to it uh, because they're like, oh, holy smokes. Like, this is a person of authority. This is someone that has power. This is somebody who's, you know, out there doing something. And I use CEO over entrepreneur, right? Because everybody knows the title CEO. You hear that on all the, all the you know, news news websites all day long of this ceo did this or the ceo did this you don't hear like this entrepreneur did this this entrepreneur is over here doing this mm -hmm. you know so when you call and say hey i have the title of ceo i'm the owner of this company i'm looking for your help everybody has an opinion at that point and they are more than happy and willing to talk to the ceo and give their opinion and feedback and to make changes and funny enough <clears throat> you know i'll tell you a story i was telling you some stories the other night but another story that kind of happened which was hilarious i called this guy and uh, I was like, Hey, I'm reaching out. Uh, you know, same thing. CEO of the company want to know what, you know, I saw you didn't buy, he was a lead, didn't purchase. Was there anything that, you know, we could, we could help you with that would, that was confusing or something about the website that you didn't like, or a question you had that made you not purchase, or was it the price? And he's like, Oh, it was a little bit of the price. There was a couple of things I have some questions about. I was like, all right, so hey, dude, we're going to go out. We're going to go implement this stuff. And I appreciate you. And, um, thanks for taking my call. And that's pretty much the end of that conversation. So we went out, we do like we do, we work freaking fast. I always talk about how our company is a speedboat, not a cruise ship. A cruise ship takes, you know, like three miles to, to turn 180 degrees. Speedboat, dude, on a dime, like we're on, we're on the way back, right? And so that's how I, how I kind of structure our company. I lead our company is, do we got to make, we got to make quick moves to make sure we're out in front of everybody. If it takes us a decision a year to make a decision, we're not doing anything. So mm -hmm. with that said, we go and make these changes, all right? We make these changes. And I'm, two days later, I'm still calling leads. His wife actually opted in to our website. His wife was someone I actually called. Didn't even know. Because I don't, I don't remember these names. I'm just dialing. And so at the end of the day, I call this. It's actually, he, he picks up. It's his phone. I was like, hey, is Caroline there? He's like, no, this is Jeff. I was like, oh, hey, Jeff. Uh, maybe Caroline, you know, was looking for some solar lights. He's like, no, actually, it was me. I just happened to use her email address this time. Um, but I actually bought. And I was like, oh, I didn't see that you purchased them because it didn't show under her email address that he'd purchased them. And I was like, oh, well, that's great that you purchased them. He goes, yeah, you actually called me two days ago. And I was, you know, reading some emails you sent me afterwards. And I really, you know, like really liked what you're doing. And I went to the website and I couldn't believe it. You actually made the changes that I had suggested. I said, yeah, we take it to heart, man. We, we go out and we make things happen. He goes, dude, I bought, I bought four, you know, wow. uh, of, of, of uh, the product. And it was, it was actually absolutely amazing. And boom, right there, right? So like, that's the piece, that's the flow that we go to is we start selling, have the avatar sell the avatar. So now it's not Trey selling anymore. It's Jeff that's selling to Jeff. Realistically, he's in a mere perspective, right? Of selling to himself, which yeah. that's, how, that's how we build our sales copy. You know, I love that. And I don't think this came up on, on the clubhouse room at all because I was trying to keep the spotlight on you and everyone else. Like one thing I try to do to separate myself as an author, I think a lot of people, they just like the mentality of like, wow, the CEO is calling. Sometimes people will try to email an author on a book and they never expect to hear back because the author is quote unquote <laughs> too busy. They've got better things to do. I've set myself apart in that I respond personally to those emails and I try to do it really fast. And what I love about this conversation that we're both, we're not saying the unspoken, but none of this is a manipulation. This is just a byproduct that we both actually care, which happens to contribute to more sales, but we're doing it through value. And I think it's such an important to set an example because, you know, from a financial standpoint, you're at a way higher level than me, but wherever you are in that kind of pecking order, if there is even is a pecking order, it's the, it's the care with which you put forth to the customer that does all the difference. So thank you for that story and for doing that, because I think it's really key lesson for people to take in, regardless of what industry or what they're selling or what they might be trying to do with their business. Yeah. You know, like you're the second person from that clubhouse that said manipulation on this. And it's like, like I was like taken back by that of, mm -hmm. of how people would think that any of these tactics are manipulation. I mean, at the, at the end of it, 
it's a disservice that we don't do it. Yes. You know, cause like if I have a beautiful product, a great product, and I'm not able to get it out to the avatars of that niche, then they're missing out. I'm doing a disservice on my end. I'm not, dude, I'm not selling properly. I'm not out, you know, preaching to the, to the niche that, Hey, you need to get the, get your hands on this. And so now their life is not any better. Their problem is not any long, any more solved than when we first started. Mm. And so, you know, I'm out doing due diligence to call these guys and be like, Hey, I need your feedback. What do you hate about it? What do you love about it? How do we make changes? How do we get better? How do we grow stronger? And by me understanding that and telling the next avatar that comes along for the first time, it makes way more sense. He's like, Oh, I see why this would help me. And at the end of the day, it's up to him to slice his credit card across the screen. Yes. Right. I'm not, I'm not behind him, hold him, holding him hostage and saying, Hey, put your credit card in or else. Like he has that decision. He has mm -hmm. the power, right? To, to be able to decide yay or nay. It's up to me to show him why he should more than not. Yes. And you know, an extra piece of this that I don't think anyone really talks about, and this is just theory, but I think that when people do what you do, um, there's an extra added level that when another product launch comes from a completely different niche, there's a certain intuition you have in how you're writing the copy from a starting point. So your foundation that you begin with even though you continue to interact with customers, it always gets stronger and stronger and stronger as you go along, moving into new products, new niches, new categories, just because you're getting that feel off those people in general, you know, a collective public consciousness that you continue to interact with and get a feel of their trends and their opinions on whatever it is that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, we use templates, that's for sure. I mean, you know, what bullet points, what paragraphs, how this stuff works, why should I buy it? You know, mm. things like that. And then realistically, it's the wording you know, the words that they use, uh, you know, one thing, I don't know if we got onto this, but I think it's a great thing for these guys to hear is again, going back to those phone calls, right? I'll take the G700, for instance, when we back, went back to the G700, we couldn't sell that flashlight for anything. I called it the G700 flashlight. I named it off of infinity. I, I drove a G37 infinity at the time and the flashlight had 700 lumens. So we called it the G700. That's how cool I was. And from that name, we tried to sell it. And I started making phone calls. Hey, you're opting in. You're, you're telling me that you're interested in this product. That's what they're doing, right? They're putting in their name, email information, say, I'm interested, but then they don't put their credit card in. They're choosing not to. So why? Why are you choosing not to put it in? And one guy got on the phone. He goes, man, I'll tell you why. Is, is it's not a tactical flashlight. It's just a regular flashlight. And I was like, dude, but it is tactical. He's like, well, it doesn't say tactical. And the cool thing with you know, the internet is you can, you can go in there and change stuff real quick. And so we put the word tactical in front of the, in front of the flashlight and boom, we're, we're off and going, you know, it was that one word that all these avatars, interesting enough that all these avatars wanted to hear, but didn't hear from, from our sales pages. And once we made that change, it's like, yes, this is exactly what I want. Uh, you know, another thing that most recently that we're selling another, another type of light right now, it's so brand new, but the same thing happened. I got on a phone call. He's like, oh, it's, it doesn't do this. It's not this. He goes, I want something that's industrial. I want something that's heavy duty. I was like, bro, this is industrial. This is heavy duty. Again, going and making those changes and boom, it, it's a big conversion change, right? Because I wasn't speaking at the frequency that he wanted to be heard at, right? Or, mm. or be reading at. And it's me figuring out, okay, where is that? Listening to what they're saying. And, and the big thing when I'm getting on these phone calls with these guys is I'm not trying to sell them. I think that's the biggest mistake a lot of people get is they're so desperate for that first sale or that fifth sale that they feel like this guy's like, yeah, I'm going to buy them later. Oh, well, hey, let me give you a discount. Like, no, that is not the point of this call. The point of this call is not to sell them. The point of this call is to figure out what's wrong, right? What stopped them? What rebuttals did they have in their mind? What limiting beliefs were they telling themselves while they're going through the sales process to not buy it? And then how do we make those changes to say, hey, you know what? It does do this. It does do this. It's going to solve this problem. It's going to solve it in these three ways, which is what other avatars have told me that it solves it in for, for them. And at the end of the day, your sales page becomes much greater, much better, right? It, it converts at a higher level because now you're telling them exactly what they want to hear and need to hear to buy the product versus kind of what you came up with when you just started out, which is usually the case that I'm going through, right? Like, I'm just like, I have no clue what they want, but we're going to start here. And then we're going to migrate to, to really what they want. Yeah. You, you take your best guess, obviously, but you also understand that it's 99% going to change. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I love it. So you're in a lot, of, I, I imagine a lot of different niches, right? Like what are the ones that you are kind of like most proud of or, or most active in right now? 
man, right, right now it's, uh, we're, we're kind of hitting the survival space. We're hitting the political space. Uh, we hit, we hit the Christmas space, uh, last December, we did a $5 million funnel hit for some Christmas ornaments, which was really great. Uh, we did a mask funnel, uh, back in, you know, March, April, May, uh, we did a big mask K95s out of, out of China. That was really cool. We did a big uh, podcast on both of those with clip funnels. If you want to go listen to that with Dave Woodward, uh, we, it, the podcast went so long because it, we went in so in depth, they had to split both of them up in two pieces. So there's actually four podcasts, uh, together for those two funnels. Uh, mm-hmm. If you want to go check those out, but yeah, the the mask I think did three million. The the ornament did five million, um, and then and then the niche that we're in right now is we're doing a kitchen space niche, and we're doing like I said the political and survival niche right, right now. Now, do you ever delve into info products, or is everything that you have physical and tangible? So the only info products I got is the coaching stuff. Got it. Like that's you know that's all the info that I sell uh, because the thing is is like for someone to go and buy a physical product, you know they want something tangible. Right, right. They're not buying info products at Walmart. They're walking in, they get to touch it, they get to feel it, they get to look at it, and then they, they get something, mm-hmm. right? They get to take home something. And I think with Amazon and with online shopping, uh, it's twofold now, which is really cool. So you have the dopamine release, like that drug that happens that pops through. Perry Belcher always talks about that. I love it. It's like, oh, that satisfaction, right? That drug that hits. Like, oh, on Amazon, you buy something and you're like, oh, man, that felt so good. But mm-hmm. then that drug happens again as soon as it hits your door. You're like, oh, the product I ordered. Yes, this is awesome. At Walmart, it all happens at once. Whereas on online shopping, it happens twice. So I, fi- I feel like there's a, there's a, he- a heavier hit on, in the online space than there is on, you know, like on a more um, like retail space. So I, I think that's a really cool uh, perspective to see uh, the online as well. But those are, those are the spaces at the end of the day that we're in, man, that way that we're hustling to. Right. And I mean, I'm making an assumption here, but I imagine that <laughs> while not necessarily like the end game from the beginning, I'm, I'm sure you probably certain of your coaching clients you end up partnering with if they have something that really makes sense for that you can help them with. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, they're selling physical products. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so it's like, okay, your physical products are no different in the funnel than, than our physical products. We got to do the same process. Every funnel, I was telling you this earlier, the, your funnel also has the, those DNAs, right? Each funnel has a DNA process. So we, we got to figure out what that DNA is. I mean, everybody's funnel is different, yes, but the process is always the same. Mm-hmm. You, you know, it's sales, it's order form, like where do I put my name and information? How do I create the lead? How do I generate the lead? How do I <clears throat> ask for the credit card? How do I organize the products in such a way where they are listed, right? They're listed. Uh, Let me see, I'm trying to explain that. So in a book sale, I'll tell you this, well, because you do books, right? Mm -hmm. The one thing that I see wrong with the book industry is funnels that only sell one book. Blows my mind. They're like, hey, here's my book, but I'm only gonna give you one. Mm. Whereas like, why don't I give them three or five or 10? You're limiting, you're limiting the buyer to only buy one today, which limits the AOV, the average, the average car value, which limits the entire funnel, the click to order, right? They're like, well, shoot, we had a lady call us. She wanted 200 ornaments. She goes, I tried to buy, I was going to buy 200 ornaments from you, but I was unable to buy them because your site doesn't let me, it limits me. Mm. So she had to call in. You're like, you're right. We need to go change our limits. I had, I had a coaching client who sold compression socks. And he sold them pairs. I said, dude, so one, two, three, four, five, and 10. And from that point forward, he's like, no one's ever going to buy 10. So I only put one, two, and three. I said, man, dude, I'm telling you, people are going to buy four, five, and 10. I guarantee it. He goes, no, man, I don't see why. Why even give him the option? I said, why not give him the option? <laughs> he goes, I know I'll do it for you. You do it for you. So he puts 10 on there within 24 hours, he sends me a boxer. He goes, dude, you won't believe it. Somebody bought 10 can't believe it. Somebody bought 10. I said, dude, that's white. It doesn't matter why they're buying it. In their head, they have a reason to buy it, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to know why they're buying it. Just understand that they understand why they're buying it. I said, you know what it means when they buy 10, right? He goes, no. I said, that means there's other people that'll buy 20. He's like, no. I said, put 20 on there. So that's 40 socks, by the way. So he puts 20 on there in 48 hours, sold the 20 unit. So then what happens 
is our brain starts messing with us, right? We go back and look at the thousand sales that we generated, the 10,000 sales that we generated at one, two, and three units and say, how many fives and tens and twenties did I just miss out on? Because I yeah. didn't, I limited my buyer to yeah. buying it. And the same thing goes with books, right? Like when I go to Barnes and Noble, dude, I'm walking out with stacks of books because I buy 10 books every time I buy one, especially if it's a really great book. Cause I want to give it to people. I want to hand it out. They're going to remember me. I get to sign it and say, Hey man, I was thinking about you as at Barnes and Nobles read this book, thought of you, Andrew, hope you enjoy it, man. And so the next time you pick that book up or, or you finish that book and I say, Hey, when you finish this book, make sure you do the same thing that I'm doing with you is you give it to somebody else, right? Mm. Pass on the knowledge. And that starts a tradition. But as authors, you know, we sit back, we're like, Oh, well, there's only one person that's going to read one book. So I'm only going to sell them one book. Who, who would need two books? Right. It, like, what are they gonna do? Put, put one book in hand? Doesn't matter. Right. It's, it's, we don't have to understand why. We, what we need to understand is that they have, they have a reason why they're buying a multitude of books. You know, Trey, I, um, I hear this and, you know, we're, we're all egotistical in our own way. I like to think of myself as a smart and insightful guy, but for some reason that has never occurred to me how the entrepreneur, how the business owner, how the person selling it can be limiting themselves and their customer with some preconceived notion that technically has no foundation in reality other than the assumption that they're making. That's amazing. That's amazing. Right. So yeah. um, we're almost out of time here. I wanna make sure I'm honoring your schedule. But one thing I did wanna ask you just based on your experience, cause <clears throat> you've been at this for a while. So you've had you know, your bumps and bruises, you've had your challenges and you've surpassed them. What these days rears its ugly head as your biggest challenge in mind? And what are you doing right now to address it? What is our biggest challenge? Yeah. Let's see. What was our biggest challenge? I don't know. Um, we've solved so many things. It's been, it's been absolutely amazing. Like we've definitely gone through a lot, a lot, a lot of challenges. Um, I could probably name the challenges better than I can name what our biggest challenge is right now, you mm. know, because we're always just trying to scale heavier, right? Like, yeah. get, I mean, get I'd, better, I'd say anything that pops in mind that you think might be important for the audience, please have at it. You know, one, one thing for us, um, man, we could tell stories for like hours, like literally hours, maybe days, uh, sitting around, you know, having like a few cocktails. But, uh, the, you know, the, the biggest thing for me was I was, I, was, I was so embedded in my head that to be successful, we needed to be a big company. Mm. And man, that just, that dude, that was my kryptonite. I didn't even know, but I was like building kryptonite uh, pods and they're just growing at, a, at alarming rates. And then I walked in one day and I couldn't even like stand up. Right. So what I mean by that is I, I hired executives. I hired uh, a full, like I, I, I grabbed a building like 7,000 square foot. And this is like, this is just me. Other people are doing this and they're doing a great job at it, but I suck at it. So I grabbed, I did a fulfillment facility. I had a call center of 50 people. I had a fulfillment facility of 25 people. So we had 75 employees. I had executive roles on top of that. We had HR compliance. We had, uh, you know, COOs, CEOs. We had CFOs. We had accounting. We had like all the things that needed to be of the company. I'm like, oh, look at all this. And we're driving some massive revenue. But then when I'm looking at the p &Ls, I'm like, the profit sucks. Because we got so many dang chiefs. We got so many employees. We got so many variables in our business. And like, we had to fire everybody. We had to fire the call center. We had to fire uh, the fulfillment center. We had to fire our executives. Like it sucked. We had to, we literally blew everything away and that and started back from fresh. And we said, okay, if we had to do it all over again, what would we do and who would we model? And um, who I started modeling and looking after was someone that run, runs the as seen on TV ads, which is AJ Cabani. And if you look at AJ Kivani's business, he has like a team of 10 people and then everything else is outsourced. He outsources his traffic, which is TV in his case. He outsources retail, which is all his distribution channels through selling his product. He outsources his inbound call center. He outsources his web design. He outsources his uh, commercials. And then basically he just has uh, executives that overlook all these like, you know, pillars, right? That, that, that see. And I'm like, what if we did that? What if we created a really cool, unique team of like two or three people that just focused on managing, right? These other agencies. And that allows us to have constants in the business. I don't have any more uh, like, hey, we got 50 call center reps that are sitting right now waiting for the next lead to come in. Right. That right. happens. 
right? I don't have 25 people at a fulfillment facility sweeping the floors, waiting for the next order to come in. Now I just have constants. Hey, I know when I get a call that comes in, it's going to be two bucks, right? On average, right? It's going to be $2. But if I have no calls that come in, I don't pay anything. When I have an order come in, I know it's $2 to get it out. When I have zero orders for a week that comes in, it's $0. That allows our company to scale at I don't want to say an infinite rate, but at an alarming rate, right? Like we can scale, we can scale a lot faster, but we can also scale back a lot faster. I don't have to go fire 25 people, right? I don't have to go worry about payroll for these guys over here. I don't need to go look for the next SBA loan to hopefully keep my company afloat, mm -hmm. right? Like that's, that's the big thing that I've learned. And, and I really had to tear down my ego, to be frank. Because my ego was, was, was pushing me and saying, hey, you need to build, you know, you need to build a huge fulfillment company. You need to build a huge logistics company, a huge call sending company. And it like, it does hurt. Like it sucks. Like that's still in me a little bit. Like, oh, we're not, you know, we're not cool enough to have all these things. But at the end of the day, I'm like, no, we're more successful right now because we don't have those things. Yeah. And there's, there's and, people that has those things that are jealous of you, but they're just not going to say it. Yeah, you, maybe so. Maybe so. Maybe they put themselves in a rut or maybe they're doing a really good, efficient job at it. Like there is, there is that too, right? Like I said, like this is just good for us. It might not be good for somebody else. Like I, I follow a, quite a few good friends of mine and we talk a lot that have big companies, right? They got tons of employees. They're doing great and they know how to do it. They've learned how to do that in a, in a way that I probably won't be able to do. It's just not in my, in my DNA, if you will. Right. So I love our team, man. We're, we're literally like right behind me, behind this screen, behind this camera, is literally about a 1200 square foot building right now. Like we are in a, a tight building. This studio barely fits in. Like there's literally a fridge over here. Uh, mm -hmm. This is like half kitchen, half studio. It's hilarious. Like you'd be like, wow, that's the studio. I'm like, oh, that's the studio. And you know, we have like two little offices that we, that we communicate out of. And then everything else is outsourced. Our fulfillment's out of Boise, Idaho. Our call center's out of Philippines. Our email replies are out of India. Like all this stuff is like just out through the, the, through the whole world. And we're operating at, you know, like doing four or five, 6,000 sales a day, just pumping out products and able to do it with these outsources because now we have constants in the business. I love this. Oh, I'm, I mean, I know my audience, I know they're paying attention, but for those that might be hearing for the first time, I hope they're paying attention because this is some really insightful, brilliant stuff that's disguised in simplicity, but this is, this is very elegant. That's, I guess, the way Steve Jobs would put it. So um, we're almost going to wrap up here because, again, I want to make sure to get you on your way. I know you've got a busy day with all these sales coming in. So with that said, if anyone might want to reach out to you, like who's someone that, that might want to connect? And if so, what's the best way for them to do it? Man, I mean, dude, we got all kinds of cool stuff. Like I've put together a free training. That's at treylewellen.com. Um, but, dude, like, you know, that's great. And I appreciate it. But that, just keep watching you, man. Just keep showing up to, to your podcast. Just keep you know, seeing what you're doing, listening and interviewing these guys like that you have on these podcasts. And at the end of the day, you know, they're going to learn, you know, and, and I'll say, I'll say this, like, like, I think a lot of mentors want to be the one mentor that, that changes people's lives. But what I've noticed and from, you know, mentoring people and from being mentored um, is you get like a piece of the puzzle from each mentor. I you rarely will you find a mentor that has like the whole puzzle. It's very, it's very, very rare. And, but I, but what's great is you have to keep doing other mentors. You keep, you got to keep, you know, searching and, and hunting for knowledge, right? Through books, through YouTube, through podcasts, just like this and through mentors, right? To, to really, really outpace the competition to learn at a, at a high level. Uh, but at the end of the day, every mentor is going to have a piece of the puzzle, but after like three or four or five or six or seven mentors, all of those puzzle pieces start to come together and it, it, it forms the life that, that you deserve right? That you're after, that you're, that you're like, your journey is about. Because how a, how a good friend of mine always put it, James P. Friel, is he goes, at the end of the day, you're the author of your own book. You get to write the pages of your book. No one else is, is holding your pen. You, you're holding your pen. And you just have to make those decisions to go out and get it, make the change today uh, to go out and, and be who you want to be. You know, like we only live so long in this life. So what's another day, right? Yeah, you know, Trey, I'm very, very tempted to end the interview on that note because that's brilliant. But I'm going to be over ambitious, overreach and ask one more question because I often do this to my guests and I, I always love the answer. So if I may, if you can go back in time, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years, whatever amount, and give a younger version of yourself any piece of advice, whether it's life advice, business advice, marketing advice, anything, what's that one thing you would say to that younger version of yourself? 
Mm. You know, I would, you know, the biggest thing that I would probably tell myself is seek, seek more mentors and be willing to pay the price. Cause my first mentor was two grand a month and I about fell over because I was only making 60 grand a year mm. and two grand after taxes and after payroll, cause I was an insurance agent, uh, two grand was what I was bringing home. So I had to swallow my pride and say, I got to do this, right? If we're going to change, let's make a change. Let's get uncomfortable. And it's just, it was just paying for that mentor. And it was the best decision I did. It was the train track that, you know, drove me to the success that we have today was that first mentor and then paying the next guy and paying the next guy and paying the next guy. You know, I, we, we pay over a hundred thousand dollars a year in mentorship uh, to, to mentors. Like I still, I still seek mentors. I still seek, uh, you know, people who, who push me. And that's what it's all about. Like, I'll, I'll never stop doing that. Mm. I don't know if I've ever shared this before, but my first paid mentorship cost me two grand a month also. So it's always really cool, the synchronicity to hear someone else, especially someone like you, who's, who's just rocking it, uh, say something like that. And Trey, thank you so much for coming on, for sharing your stories, sharing your insights, sharing your wisdom. Um, this was such a really happy surprise for me because Less than 48 hours ago is like when we just popped in the same clubhouse room. And, yeah. and here we are, you were being, you were so generous with your time and energy. Be like, yeah, I'll pop on and do an interview. Sure. And I know that my audience is all the better for it, man. So thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Hey man, thanks for having us on. Appreciate it, Andrew. Thank you again, Trey. That was awesome. Guys, you definitely want to check out TreyLlewellen.com, see what he's got going on there. And um, really, I hope that you listen back to this interview, because like I said, this is both one of my favorite personally, but also, in my opinion, one of the most useful, especially for entrepreneurs out there. And uh, also, obviously, a quick reminder, if you haven't done so already, feel free to go to LastLawOfAttractionBook.com if you want to check out my book on Amazon, The Last Law of Attraction Book You'll Ever Need to Read. Or you can go to YouTube.com slash Andrew Cap if you want to check out the YouTube channel devoted to it. Uh, with that said, this is just the start of things. We've got way more awesome guests on the way probably sooner than you expect. So stay tuned and I will see you next time. Thank you for listening to Shatter the Mold at www.shatterthemoldpodcast.com. My name is Andrew S. Kaplan. My name is Andrew S. Kaplan and it's time to shatter the mold.